very happy to present to you today. This is about shaping transformation. Transformation in this case means digital transformation, among other things, of course. So how can we achieve this? Not just by involving staff, but turning them into empowered individuals with agency. And for that, I have brought an approach to present to you for small and medium-sized companies, which I will present to you today. Before I get started with the solution, we shall have a quick look of what transformation means. We speak about the four big Ds that we're currently facing, digitalization, decarbonization, deglobalization, as well as demographic change, which, you know, we're all lacking specialists. There's a certain scarcity of skilled labor, and all of this has a significance as to how we train new staff and how we integrate staff in our organizations. Continuous learning, lifelong learning, environmental consciousness, the development of resilience that we require, and also the an inclusive way of organizing a company where employees, where you can integrate and you know think about different types of employees. If we look at the current situation in Germany, and I have heard it numerous times. Apparently, we're a world champion if you look at the different studies when it comes to the readiness for digital transformation or the willingness to transform. We're ranking 14th in the world ranking, but um, the pressure is rising in terms of competition. So further training opportunities do become necessary in order to, to be competitive on this field and to strengthen our position. This requires financial resources, of course. People often say that we have a lack of expertise and many burdens that people have identified. In combination, in combination with um, our daily business, which is booming at the moment, there is too much work even. Digitalization at certain points is something that we neglect, despite the fact that we direly need it in order to simplify processes. So what do the employees say? They're not necessarily enthusiastic about it, but they perceive it as a burden, as I said earlier. And this is um, understandable because digitalization, of course, means that a lot of work has to be done in order to well, digitize these processes and make them usable. If we look further than the digitalization, which we find in many different companies, you can look at it on different levels. And if we look at SMEs, then you notice that even on the lowest levels, there is a lot of potential that we could tap. And this does not necessarily concern new business models, digital offers, but rather about creating a new digital infrastructure and to digitize processes. On these lower levels, that is where we should get started. And for that, we need the employees who will push these processes forward. If you keep this in mind, then we shall have a look at the strategic dialogue of the automotive industry in Lower Saxony. We entered a partnership and developed a program through which we can actually introduce these um, digitalization projects into organizations. This is essentially a newly founded um, company, as well as the demographic agency, which um, work together. We have um, many psychologists involved in this so that we know what needs to be done in order to introduce, implement these IT systems in existing organizations. We have carried out five iterations. We have trained 65 change managers and worked on 28 change projects. We offer this at companies within the framework of um, publicly subsidized projects. We work together regarding, well, regarding digitalization. But with this concept, we're also introducing the system project. We're involved in projects where resilient value creating chains are being set up through this program, and we have a large competence center for a circular economy, 
which is where we're active with our program. Here's another slide on the different companies who have um, participated in this. And you'll be able to tell that we have um, many different industries, electrics, mechanical engineering, also regular craftsmanship. You know, there are many different projects that we are processing, a lot of them on the digitization of um, internal production processes, but also the digitization of um, customer requirements and jobs, logistics processes, as well as well as a cultural change. That is to say, how do we how do we even talk to each other about this topic, and how do we design our communication channels so um, employees, as a part within the framework of these projects, worked on it and elaborated well, their own findings, really. If we look at the different challenges that SMEs were facing, I um, brought you these two perspectives, if you will, these um, testimonies. The employees say the systems we use are not linked at all, and you often have to search in several places, which is very time intensive. All people said, I've never had any contact with digital tools like that, and I've never been a fan of them. The management, on the other hand, they say that they have been obliged to do things for many years, but haven't really got around to implementing it properly. They've um, made experiments which didn't work out properly, and they had to digitize processes with um, their own onboard tools the default tools which they have um, access to. And this is an arduous process. I look at the, um, since I hail from further training, lifelong learning, back in the day, you would qualify your employee and with um, what they learned, then for a long time, you could actually work with it, with um, their knowledge. Back in the 90s, this was disrupted already. People started speaking about the myth of um, further training. And, well, the intervals, they actually shortened. And since the 90s, this is something that we find in many companies. They have an integrated learning approach within the work, so information will be provided to the employees, which they could um, directly pick up at the workplace and then implement where employees would get together in groups, and they would then discuss the corresponding solutions. In my opinion, this is not sufficient at the moment. Both approaches on their own as a standalone approach will not be sufficient in order to attain decent results. Rather, we're in disruptive times, including disruptive technologies that require new processes. And in this era, we require some out Side, some external knowledge from universities, say, which we can integrate into those companies. And at the same time, those solutions need to be adaptable to an extent where this works in your own organizational structures. So these need to be, um, well, you need to be able to combine them. We train employees in order to become change managers. And we do so by giving them a project within their organization that they're supposed to work on. So first of all, within the organization, we define a project. And in this preparation phase, on the very left, that's what we do there. Then the company, they say, those are the topics that we would like you to work on. You assign this task to two employees. They work as a tandem. They're never on their own, who then work on this project together. And then through this process, which takes about half a year, they are then trained, they are capacitated in order to work on this project. How exactly do we do it? And why do we do it that way? We know from research on further training that it is always difficult to actually apply what you've learned in further training in your everyday work at the company. So if you have a closer look, then if participants are happy with their further training, that's what's being measured in most companies. You know, you would have questionnaires. This has nothing to do with whether they have actually learned something useful for them that can be applied at the organization. So people tend to say that 10% of what you learn in a training course will then be implemented in the organization. This is a number where you might say, is it that bad? 
Yeah, I think there's still a lot of untapped potential, to be honest. We know from research that there are factors responsible for this. The fact that there's some transfer to your everyday work can actually function. It is about the motivation of the participants to even transfer the knowledge and has to be organized in a way that we enable such a transfer. We need to always consider further training sessions and how they can apply it. And this is something that we find time and again. The work environment is what's actually important as to how colleagues react to it, how superiors react to further training. Is there even an opportunity to apply the gained knowledge? Many employees say, well, you know, the IT the software systems, they are not ready to be employed and we cannot work with it. So we have difficulties with um, the application of knowledge and it doesn't make a lot of sense to follow this approach. So we know of many factors that we actually look into, but we have um, good solutions as to how we can actually work on them together with our partners. Beyond that, we know how this process works. The support by superiors, by supervisors, for instance, peer support is very important in order to create the motivation to transfer the knowledge, somebody to actually be willing to carry out the transfer because it might not work initially, to keep it up, and then to transfer the contents from the training course in order to then boost the individual organizational results. And we know that if we want to, we can actually use the development in terms of staff in order to push forward the development of the organizational structure, that this knowledge will then need to be shared within the organization. And we also had a look at those processes. And we found that this is the colleagues' responsibility and the supervisor's reaction to that particular motivation. We had a further look as to what the conditions are where companies might say, this is how learning can happen within the organization. The results were that it shall not require a lot of time, that you should have intervals of training. And from research, we know that interval trainings, that is to speak, that is to say, um, Smaller sessions, shorter sessions are more effective in the long run. Beyond that, we know that we need to consider individual learning goals and topics. So if somebody joins the training course, if they know what they want to achieve, which we saw at this project, we know that we need to design the social as well as the organizational context properly. We also need to plan the trial periods between the training blocks and we should not extend the modules over too long a period of time. And if you look at it, then each individual person is on a learning path working towards a goal. This should contain formal parts where, which concern the training as well as informal components where I have an exchange with my colleagues. Could be a WebEx training as an occasion where I look more deeply into the contents that were conveyed. So for each individual, this is a sequence, maybe a chain, rather, where certain contents and modules get together in order to, to reach a destination. For that, it is important that the participants shall receive feedback, they shall receive support, feedback on how well something works, individual support as well through questions reflection questions, if you will, to um, think more deeply about what has been learned in order to maintain the willingness to learn and then to transfer the new knowledge to projects. This means that on the one hand, we have this um, support which our staff is supposed to receive and then we have the transfer projects which allow us to operate. We shall now have a look as to how we continue and how we implemented it. So we have our projects. We know that they're important. And then, first of all, we look from vision to innovation. 
So we try to create a network within the organization, have a look at who can contribute to this, who might also have a different point of view with regard to the topic. And we also work with by employing design thinking approaches. We really centered on the user where we approach colleagues in order to find good solutions for the organization. This is something that we have learned from literature and we know this from our own research, that it is important to make use of those networks for the sustainable training and for the sustainable maintenance of the knowledge within the organization. So learn successes, if you will, through communication will be successful by the use of those networks in order to actually disseminate the knowledge which people have gained within the organization and we need different actors within the network, could be colleagues, could be tandem partners. There might even be the managers or company experts which we need to integrate here from whom we can learn and who support us so that we can actually harness the expertise of everyone. On the next slide, you can see one run through that we have been organized. This was one of the first meetings that took place. Everybody was still wearing face masks. During this event, we had predominantly employees working in the field of production who had not known all the digital tools which we are now using day in, day out. And we were really concerned about whether this was going to turn out to be successful. but. That was exactly the case. It became a complete and utter booster. We carried out an onboarding of the tools. And the first event was held purely digitally and it ran rather smoothly. Why is that good the way it should be? Because it gives us the possibility to scale up the program as desired. And it's not only going to be limited to the region of Braunschweig, where high travel expenses will be incurred, but it can be rolled out at a much broader scale. On the next slide, you see a lot of different aspects concerning the network of the change makers that need to be taken into account, where you can actually benefit from the topics that are being dealt with by others. Many other change makers might work on similar items, and you know, therefore we establish connections and we inform about the seminars which were held during the previous years as well so that we can actually learn our lessons from them. Here you can see a small insight into design thinking. This is all about working on the requirements and needs, coming up with tangible, successful solutions which really meet the requirements of the employees involved. They are in the role of the users or the clients, respectively. Many of the participants say, well, this was extremely exciting, very well structured. It was very beneficial to talk to my colleagues because it helped me find out and define what I really need. Now you can understand the workflows, you can tap additional potential. And in this particular manner, you can find the data that you need for decision making processes with regards to the implementation. Of course, change is never easy. Not everybody is really enthusiastic about change or transformation to be brought about. But research findings tell us again and again that it's very often due to the fact that we talk in the improper manner about, com about changes. So how do we communicate about transformation processes? That is a very decisive question. Now, we've learned from literature that 70% of the transformation processes normally fail. There are hardly any reports about successful processes of transformation, and we're living at a time where we can't really afford to. 70% of failure rates, totally unacceptable. If you keep on looking, then people normally say, well, it's due to the participants who are not willing to join in. They refuse to cooperate. But I do hold the view that this is most definitely not the case. We've learned the opposite from our research, because there is normally very close interaction. Very often, managers or change agents or change makers and deliberately contribute to the fact that people actually resist and refuse to cooperate. So therefore, we've got to come up with the right communication strategy in order to convey the message and make people enthusiastic about change. 
When we look at it, when we try to weigh the pros and cons, we know that we've got to provide our participants with motivation during the introductory mark. And of course, in psychology, we've all learned that we all tend to keep the status quo. Nobody really wants to bring about fundamental change, you know. And we, as I said before, we try to weigh the pros and cons, but it is our task to present change in such a way that it becomes appealing and attractive. A lot of emotions need to be tied to change processes. This happens in a quite normal, regular communication situation. Now, this is one of our employees who says, well, fair enough, there is always room for improvement. Changes need to be brought about. But on the other hand, she says, well, I'm happy with the status quo. So I don't know why things have to be transformed completely. A very typical reaction to potential change. What do we normally do? Well, we move on to the right bit and keep on asking questions. And that is the most serious mistake ever to be made. It would be much better to move onto the blue box by asking, well, what needs to be imp improved? What are the paintballs? Where do we need to bring about improvements? Against this backdrop, we need to zoom in on the nitty gritty. How do we convey our messages in the course of communication? And this is what our change makers learn when they talk to their colleagues. Don't try to limit their autonomy when they do their work. Don't try to pass on pieces of recommendation without being asked and don't tell them yes, but, or give them instructions, do this, that, or the other, or don't talk about reasons which are of concern, or don't warn them by saying, well, if you go on like this, you won't get anywhere. These are all issues that limit the employee's autonomy and will encourage them to refuse to accept any idea concerning transformation or change. All this can be tried out and tested. For that matter, we've worked out a digital tool with which all this can be tested because you want to strengthen motivation in the initial discussion and you want to be fit for the job. And this is what our change makers learn in the course of qualification seminars. There is another important topic, and that is what we call look and feel. This is where our engineers normally come along. They provide us with a lot of input on new future technologies, which are very often tailor-made for particular projects. This is know-how that our colleagues bring along. They inform us about the current state of play, about the situation in the field of research, where can additional potential be tapped. And then you can scale it and filter it out. What do I need? What fits into my organizational setup? There is one additional field where we ask ourselves, well, how can we learn that and pass on that knowledge to our colleagues? Because every change normally means that everybody else also need to take something on board do his own work and be qualified for new skills. And we also try to give our employees the skills that they need, pass on the knowledge as easily as possible. We want to provide them with new insights and support them as best we can. At the end of the day, we also need to share our success stories with as many people as possible. So you get a possibility to present yourself. The management, of course, will be joining during these events as well. And then you roll out these new ideas slowly but surely to the entire workforce. You can also do the same in the networks. Normally, these events are quite big and have a large number of participants. Some of our colleagues who have not yet ever learned to present their results can be made fit for the job. And this actually provides them with new skills. And then the manager at the end of the day might say, OK, now I know what the workforce really wants. It was a bit difficult in the past. They came to me and spoke to me several times before, but I didn't really understand what they wanted. All this will be reflected and evaluated over a longer period of time. The managers are informed as well on a regular basis. And here, let me inform you about some of the reactions, some of the feedback that we got. You know, you can make sure that your new knowledge will be deeply rooted in your daily life and new knowledge can be passed on to new organizational structures. And the management replied in the following fashion as well. Our participants really benefited from that. New ideas were brought into the organization and potential managers had been identified. We also carried out interviews in order to get some more feedback 
And at various different levels, is it possible for us to say that individuals benefited from these seminars, the organizational benefited from that, and when you think about the circular economy and sustainability, the society by and large also benefited from that. So we can really make a contribution. So what do we do now? We rolled out knowledge from the individuals to the organizational. We made individuals join forces. We made individuals shape their work, contribute to the transformation process. This concept can be applied to various different sectors and be used for various different challenges. We spoke about software implementation, sustainability, digitalization, and many other items. The cultural change also can be covered with this concept. Due to the HR development that we organize in this particular fashion, organizations can be influenced. In that sense, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion to follow.